what is God saying today? What is God speaking today? That is the question that we must act and we must give ourselves to finding out the answer. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 and 4, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Abraham. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 4, the scripture tells us that that word of the Lord came to Samuel. In 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 11, the word of the Lord came to Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 13, the word of God came to the prophet of God. It is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 17 that that word from God came to a man named Elijah. 2 Kings chapter 15 and verse 12 chronicles the fact that God's word came to a man by the name of Jehu. In 1 Chronicles 22 and 8, David heard a word from God. It was in 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 7 that the word of the Lord, everybody say the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to a man by the name of Shemaiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1, the scripture tells us that it was God's word that came to Jeremiah. Ezekiel heard the word of the Lord in Ezekiel chapter 1. And on and on we go in Holy Scripture. Hosea heard a word from God. Jonah heard a word from God. Micah had the word of the Lord come to him. Haggai and Zechariah all heard the word of the Lord. It was the children of Israel that journeyed through the wilderness based totally on a word from God. Kings ruled in peacetime and they waged war in turmoil based solely on a word from God. Fear was abolished and hope sprung alive because of a word from the Lord. And that is why at the dawn of this new year, I feel it very important that we not just casually enter 2014, but we say in prayer, God, we need to hear your word for this year. I've come and I've risen to this pulpit this morning, I believe, with the anointing of the Holy Ghost to preach that we need a word from God. We need a word from God for our church. We need a word from God for our family. We need a word from God for our kids. We need a word for God for our small groups. We need a word from God for the ladies and for the men and the teenagers and the children. We need a word from God. It was a horrendous time in Samaria. The Bible says there was no food, not just a little food, there was no food. People had resorted to buying the head of a donkey in the market and boiling that and eating that. They were resorting in some circles to cannibalism. I'm, I'm telling you in Samaria in Second Kings, times were desperate. And yet in the middle of that desperation, Second Kings chapter 7 and verse 1 tells me this, Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow, everybody say tomorrow, tomorrow about this time, flour will be sold for a shekel and barley will be available at the gate of Samaria. It looked bad on Monday, but the word of the Lord came and said on Tuesday, it's going to be different. It looked desperate on Tuesday afternoon, but the word of the Lord came through the man of God and said, this time tomorrow, it's going to be different in Samaria. You woke up without food, but tomorrow you're going to go to bed with your bellies full because the provision of the Lord is coming for God's people. 
I don't know who all I'm preaching to today, but your impossibility can change in one day. Now, there's times I type it out and put the words, but I'm going to go off script right now. I want someone to realize that what you have viewed as an impossibility this year in one day can change. That young man you've been praying for, that daddy that you've been interceding for, that mama that you've been crying hot tears over, one day can change everything. I want someone to rise up in your spirit and believe that a word from the Lord can change everything. How many of you know what it is for God to step in in the middle of a midnight hour and what seemed to be impossible was changed by the miraculous hand of Almighty God? I'm talking about a word from the Lord. I'm talking about somebody realizing there's hope for your family and there's hope for your situation and there's healing for your body. There's power in a word from God. Everybody say a word from God. I want you to turn to someone and touch them on the shoulder and say, it can change this time tomorrow. It can change. Let me tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost. Somebody's going to give testimony in 2014 of the difference one day made in your life. I wish there'd be somebody that would just resonate with that. It one day, it was bad one day but it changed for the better the next day. That's what happens when a word from God resonates in our spirit. I prophesy backsliders are going to come back. People are going to pray through. Waters of baptism are going to be troubled. A word from God. A word from God. That's what we need. It's what we need. Everybody shout amen. So I have been asking the Lord for the last several weeks, what is God saying to New Life Church in 2014? Now, I have to tell you, I get a little bit envious, if I can say that and still be okay. I get a little envious of preachers that hear these grand statements and paragraphs, and it seems as though that heaven itself wrote with the quill pen of eternity on their spirit, And it just pours out of them. I don't know how you are, but I don't hear God like that. I hear God in words. (laughs) And so in 2014, I have asked the Lord before this year started, what do you want to say to New Life Church? And the Lord spoke three words to me. Three words. Here they are. Everybody. Somebody. And anybody. I didn't expect we'd jump over chairs on that one. I was praying, God, what do you want to say to New Life Church in 2014? And I was sitting there and the Lord said, write this down. Everybody. Somebody. And anybody. And I wrote it down and I looked at three words on a piece of paper. I thought to myself, now God, you know on January 12th, I'm going to walk to that pulpit and I'm going to share what you're saying to New Life Church for 2014. And I, I guess you could take over, but I need a little bit more than three words. Everybody, somebody, and anybody. And I began to pray over those words. God, what do you mean everybody? What do you mean somebody? What do you mean anybody? And the Lord began to speak into my spirit. And... Uh, I want to just remind this church, and some of you that are new, if I say remind, just indulge me. I know you haven't heard it before, so it's new to you. But I want to remind New Life Church and reveal it to others, the reason why this church exists. And that is to reach the lost. Praise God. The reason why we had a prayer meeting on July the 20th, 1999, in a living room with four of us to start the service. And then it grew to seven, and then it grew to 15, 
And then we rented a, a Presbyterian church. And we went from there to that storefront where Maddie and TJ got married. And we went from there to the front third of this building. And then two years ago, two and a half years ago, we bought this whole building. And now we've remodeled this and we're out of room already. But the reason why we've done all of that, the reason why we bought a keyboard and the reason why we built, built things and built, bought a pulpit and bought chairs and painted walls and the reason why we get together is not just to hang a shingle outside that said there's a church along 167 in Cabot, but the reason why this church is here is so it might be a lighthouse that shines in a dark world for people that are lost. That's why this church is here. We haven't come just because we don't have anything else to do. This is a lighthouse to reach the lost. I had something happen to me this week that I hadn't happened, had happened for a long time. I was interviewed this week. And I sat down in this interview and the person asked me at the close of this interview, they said, Pastor Gaddy, what would be a motto for your life? I've never been asked that before. And I had a little insight before the interview of the questions that were going to be asked, so I uh, prayed about it. And I said, Lord, what would be the motto for my life? And here's what it is. Here, here's Tim Gaddy's motto for life. Honor people. That means treat them right. Serve God. That means give Him everything you have. Worship freely. By the way, I'm going to get to the last point because there's only four of them. But I believe in worshiping freely. In case you haven't realized, we like to worship freely here at New Life. I've had people come. I've had friends of mine come that I know from around town. and went, woo, man, y'all get excited at New Life Church. I believe it. You want to know why? Because we're wired like that. We are wired. Nobody can prove this to me different. We are wired to worship freely. It's just a matter of what it is that we're going to worship. Because the most quiet, laid-back, reserved individual, if you find their button, they'll worship. It might be a football team. It might be an Xbox game. It might be a movie star. But if you push the button, even the most reserved among us will get excited. Well, you know what? I walked in here this morning about 7.15 and God pushed my button again. And he made me realize I have brought you up out of sin. I have healed your body. I've given you grace when you didn't deserve it. I extended mercy to you that you do not deserve. And he didn't have to push very far. I said, God, you are worthy. God, you are worthy. I've made up in my mind I'm going to worship freely. Come on, let's take a moment and do that right now. Somebody praise Him. Somebody worship Him freely right now. Hallelujah! You're worthy, Lord. Woo! You may be seated. Honor people. Serve God. Worship freely. And the last one, reach the lost. And when I said that, the person interviewing me got a quizzical look on their face. And they said, excuse me? What do you mean, reach the lost? And it made me realize, and this is no discredit to the interviewer, it made me realize there is a vast difference between hearing that people are lost and understanding that people are lost. So I'm going to cut right down into our business today. I'm going to get right down where the rubber meets the pavement today. I still believe that without Jesus Christ, people will go to hell. Now, I know we're not, we're not going to run aisles on that. We're not going to, woo, preach it, pastor. Because none of us like to think about that. But here, I still believe in a thing called eternity. I know it may not be a popular message and it may not be politically correct, but I believe that apart from the saving power of Jesus Christ, we are doomed to live apart from God for all of eternity. And if I truly believe that, 
then I'm going to do everything in my power to teach a Bible study, to share the gospel, to let somebody know you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. You don't have to be unforgiven. You can be forgiven by the power of God. I'm here to tell you our mission as a church is to reach the lost. And so, I come to point one. Who are we going to reach for? Everybody. Everybody. So, I looked up the word everybody in the dictionary. Ready? This is mind-blowing. Buckle your seatbelts. Everybody means every person. Wow. Okay. Let's take it a little further. What do you mean, Brother Gaddy? I'm not following you. You need to make it plain. Okay, I'm going to help you. On the count of three, everybody in the house, hold your breath. Ready? Go. One, two, three. Now keep holding it. 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 Okay, you can let it out. If you just in that moment sucked air into your lungs, you are a candidate for salvation. So the question is, are they breathing? And if they're breathing, we're going to reach for them. If they are alive... We're going to reach for every person, every body, everybody that has life in their body. And by the way, you say, what if they're dead? We'll pray that God will raise them up so we can reach them still. But every body, that means those that have no money and those that are millionaires. That means people that are a different skin color than you and me and those that have nothing to offer society. That means people that have normal relationships and people with dysfunctional relationships. Hear me now. That means straight people and that means people with same-sex attraction. We're going to reach. Hear me right now. They need Jesus. So with everything inside of me, I'm going to reach. I'm going to reach for everybody. I'm going to reach for everybody. Why? Because people need Jesus. People need Jesus. Second Peter. You can find this in your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all, everyone say all. That means everybody. That means every living person. All should come to repentance. He is not willing that any should perish. That means everybody is a candidate for salvation. So we as a church this year are with God's help are going to reach for everybody. So, and I know this is more for our church family right now. If you are out talking to someone and a little thought, Jasmine, can you come and join me up here? And a little thought goes fleeting through your mind. I wonder if it would be okay if... Uh, I, I bring this person to church. Yes. Amen. It's all right. It's all right. Just stay right here with him. I'm sorry. I felt anointed to preach something else. Remember someone told me one time of a story of a church that uh, they had a bunch of bus kids come to the church. They picked them up in a bad neighborhood in town and they brought them to church. And... Uh, they noticed that as they brought those bus kids, those bus kids didn't know how to act in church. 
They didn't know how to sit still, and they would run up and down the hallways, and they'd mark up the walls, kicking the walls, all sorts of stuff like that. And, and one, I guess it was a well-meaning saint, came up to pastor and said, Pastor, we've we, we got to stop this. The, the walls are getting marked up, and it just looks bad because these kids don't know how to act in church. Can I just tell you something? I don't think we have that problem here, but I just want to go on record and say, I would rather have marked up walls that we have to fix than have a sterile environment where people who don't know how to act in church don't feel like they can come to church. That's good preaching, Brother Gaddy. Come on, who is God's call to? It's for everybody. It's for every person. That's who we're going to reach. Every body. People with mental problems. People that have it all together. People that are down and out. That's the mission of the church. Ready? God wants to reach white people. Now listen what that sounds like in Spanish. God wants to reach me. Dios quiere hablar conmigo. God wants to reach you. Dios quiere conectarse con usted. God wants to reach people that speak English. Dios quiere conectarse con personas que hablan inglés. God wants to reach people that speak Spanish. Dios quiere conectarse con personas que hablan español. I don't know if there's a word for this. God wants to reach people that speak redneck. <laughs> Dios quiere hablar con las personas del rancho. God, God wants to reach people that don't know how to talk. Dios quiere conectarse con personas que no saben hablar. God wants to reach people that all they can do is curse. Dios quiere hablar con las personas que no hablan bien, que hablan palabras que no vamos a decir aquí. People need Jesus. La gente necesita a Dios. People with white skin need Jesus. People with brown skin need Jesus. People with red skin need Jesus. People with yellow skin need Jesus. People with thin skin need Jesus. Can you tell this is totally unrehearsed? She's doing awesome. I thank God for Jasmine Lyon. Thank you, Jasmine. Come on, somebody. Glory a Dios. Gracias, Señor. In the name of Jesus Cristo, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody. That's why we're going to support missionaries. That's why we're going to send funds around the world. Because everybody needs Jesus. Everybody say, that's the mission. That's the mission of the church. You may be seated. And then there's somebody. Jesus gives very pointed instruction in John chapter number 6. If you've got a Bible, I wish you would turn there to John chapter 6. I'm not going to be much longer, I don't think, today. John chapter 6. And verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Watch what Jesus said. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. In other words, Jesus says there's going to be a segment of followers that follow me simply because of what I give them. There are people that follow Jesus because He could multiply bread and fish and provide lunch. He could heal their diseased son and raise their dead daughter to life. And Jesus said, the reason why some of you are following me is because of the loaves and the fish. And so I have reconciled in my mind and found it to be true in 25 years of ministry that there will be, there will always be a segment of God's church. 
and I want to say that well, a segment of God's church. They're a part of God's church. That are a part because of what God does for us. But not everybody's going to fall in that category. There's going to be somebody this year that says, I will pay the price and I will follow Him. I'm going to graduate beyond what's in it for me. And I'm not going to be just a taker of loaves and fish. But I'm going to be that somebody that says, Lord, where you go, I will go. Don't you understand that the disciples don't have anywhere to lay their head? And you're not assured that you're going to have your next meal. It doesn't matter. If you lead, Lord, I will follow. I will lay down my life. For you, this is what discipleship is all about. It is one thing to have a tremendous harvest. And I thank God for the harvest. I thank God for people being water baptized and filled with the Spirit of God. That adds such excitement to a local church. But I believe that the true growth of a church is not simply in what happens in the altar, but those who take up the mantle of discipleship and say, Lord, I will go where you want me to go. I will follow your plan for giving and your plan for my family. I will not wet my finger and put it up in the air and be driven by pop culture, but I will truly be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, I believe, is the mark of a growing church. It's not just in how many pray through. It's in who's drawing closer to God. Jesus uses some words in Mark chapter number 8. I wish you would look at this in your Bible, please. Mark chapter number 8 and verse number 34. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him, what's that next couple words? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Hear me right now. In 2014, and I'm not being pessimistic, I'm just being real right now. Not everybody is going to lay down their life and follow him. But somebody is. Some Nexus student is saying in your spirit today, this is going to be a different year than I have ever had before. I'm going to be that somebody that follows him, that walks with him, that lays my life down, that loses my life so that I might be saved. Somebody. I, I would to God that there would be a somebody in every small group at New Life Church. I would to God that there would be a somebody in every neighborhood in this church that would say, I'm that somebody. I'm going to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. There's not going to be a price too high for me to pay to follow after the, the hand of God and the, the wisdom of God. I'm going to be more than just a chair sitter. I'm going to be actively involved in the prayer room. I'm going to make the prayer room my friend. I'm going to be an evangelist reaching lost people. I will be that somebody. Jesus began to teach his disciples and he used harsh words, words that seemed to be just so contrary to normal thought. He said in John 6, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can have no part in me. 
Now, I won't go through all of that passage. You can read that on your own. But it's interesting to note that at the end of that passage, you can read it in John chapter 6, at the end of that passage with that morbid graphic wording that if you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you'll, have, you'll be saved and you'll be a disciple. At the end of that passage, the Bible says, after these things, many followed him no more. Because on the surface... That's some freaky verbiage. What? Eat of flesh and drink of blood. But we have to understand that everything Jesus said not only had import in that moment, but was a type and shadow of what would come. So when he is speaking these graphic words to his followers, he is telling them the kind of death that he would go through and the kind of path that he would go on. And he is inviting them in that moment to lay their life down. And you notice that not many of the 5,000 took up that mantle. But 11 of them did. And they literally gave all to follow Jesus. Somebody is going to say, that's me this year. Not everybody, but somebody. So what will we do as a church? We will endeavor to reach everybody. We'll set up practical ways for somebody, those somebodies, to follow Jesus fully and committed. And then we come to that last word, anybody. I, uh, I have to confess something. I've been in churches before where when I walked in the church, in the first few moments, it gave off a vibe. Excuse that modern word right there. It gave off a vibe. Okay, now don't, don't say, but just nod or smile. How many of you have ever been, let me just take it out of church life. How many of you have ever been to someone's house? And when you walked in that house, you could tell, you know, I'm not really welcome here. <laughs> Some of you are going, recently that's happened to me. We were privileged last Sunday to have Steve and Carrie Shirley here. My goodness, Brother Shirley did a great job preaching the word. And uh, Sister Carrie Shirley met me right over here after the service. And here's what she told me. I didn't ask for it. She just came out and told me. She said, you know what, Brother Gaddy, I just want to commend the church. It's an exciting place. She said, when we walked through the doors, we felt an excitement and like people were happy to be here. And you know what? I liked hearing that. You want to know why? Because I'm used to being here. And I think that's the way it is, but she's not. So I could tell it's actually what I thought it was. That always helps. But I've also been in settings before when it seemed that if people walked in with issues and they needed a change in their life, that to get from where they are to where they hope beyond hope that maybe they could be someday. Because of the culture of that place, because of the vibe of that place, it seemed nigh unto impossible that that is so far off from where I find myself right now. And so I'm going to make a statement. It's going to be a... a, a, a mantra, if you will, that we're going to keep saying all year long. And I, I really feel like when I say this, it's going to have an effect in 2014, but it's also going to have an effect today, right now in this house, because God knew who was going to be here before any of us got here. At this church, as long as I got breath in my body and I'm leading, anybody can be forgiven. Anybody. 
We were in year one of our church. In fact, I want to ask our musicians to come if they would. We were in year one of our church. We were meeting in Hope Presbyterian Church, renting it out on Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock. And um, we had a, Sister Bennett will remember those days. We had a small group of probably 12 or 15 of us that would faithfully gather together. And um, some of y'all don't know this, but when we had our second Sunday service at New Life back in uh, December of, of 1999, Daryl and Gwen were at our second service. They weren't even members of our church at the time. I think about that often, Brother Daryl, all those years ago, not knowing that God was going to bring our paths back together. And we'd be dedicating your grandbaby today. How cool is that? God's sneaky like that, isn't he? <laughs> We had about 12 or 15 of us there that day and they had this monstrosity of a pulpit at the Presbyterian Church. It was big and I don't like anything big. Unless it's a meal or something. Now, so I'm, I'm preaching behind this big pulpit. And, and, and I, I don't even remember all that I preached but I do remember saying if you're here today I want you to know that you can be forgiven of your sins. We can take you to the waters of baptism. And in that moment of baptism, God can wash every one of those sins away. Now, I'm going to tell you something. At that time in my life, that was in 19, uh, 2000, so I was 30. And for 30 years, I'd heard preachers say stuff like that. You can be forgiven of your sins. You can have those sins washed away in the waters of baptism. And when I said that that day in 2000, there was a sweet lady sitting out in the middle section. There were side sections, and, a, and we all normally sat in the middle section, so we were all together. And Katie was sitting right out in the middle section, and it looked like that I stuck her finger in a light socket. When I said that statement about being forgiven and your sins washed away, Katie went. And I, at first I thought, man, what did I say? Did I say something goofy or shocked her? So we all started praying, all 12 of us. And I slipped on back to Katie and I said, Katie, can I pray with you today? She said, yeah. She, she had no concept of that type of church. I said, can I pray? She said, yeah. And then she stopped me before I began praying. And here's what she said to me. And I will never forget this as long as I live. This girl looked at me and she said, Do you mean to tell me that everything wrong I've ever done, God can forgive me of that today? And He can wash those sins away? Brother Davis, in that moment, I knew this was not material she studied before. This was like a revelation to her. Do you mean to tell me, Pastor, that I can be forgiven of every lie I've said, every cheating I've done, every time I was unfaithful to my spouse? You mean to tell me God can forgive me of that? He can wash those sins away as though I never committed them. And I looked at her and I said, yes, ma'am. That's what that means. She looked at me and she said, I'm ready for that. I wonder how many people here today and how many people outside of this church would say if that was presented to them, I'm ready for that. I'm ready to get this weight off of my back. I'm ready to quit being beat up by the devil at night because of all the rotten stuff that I've done. So you're in a church today, friend, guest. If I haven't got to meet you yet, let me just tell you, anybody can be forgiven by the power of Jesus. doesn't matter what you've done. I won't even go down the list, but if you can name it, God can forgive it.
John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The book of Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, Isaiah prophesied and said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Anybody can be forgiven. All it takes is us saying, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me and wash me clean. Uh, we didn't have a baptismal tank. And so I asked somebody in the church, the, the 12 of us that were, 15 of us that were part of that church, says, anybody know where we can baptize somebody? And a couple that were there with us at the time, they said, well, we got a hot tub. I said, that's good enough. I said, can you go fill that baby up? We're coming over this afternoon. My wife will remember this. It was one of those hot tubs. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. It was one of those hot tubs that it goes down to its deepest point in the middle. So you walk downstairs to the middle. It was the easiest baptism I have ever conducted in all of my days. Because I said, Katie, you ready? She said, I want to have those sins washed away. I said, you ready to be baptized? Yes, yes, sir. Well, just walk down there in the middle and get to the deepest point. So she said, okay. She was a short gal. So when she got down in the deepest part of the hot tub, the only thing (laughs) sticking up out of the water was her hair. Oh, now when I was in Bible school, I know you may find this funny. When I was in Bible school, we were in training to be preachers. So they taught us how to baptize people, how to put them down and how to bring them back up. But they never taught me how to baptize someone in a hot tub. So I said, Katie, because you have repented of your sins and your faith is in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And I took two fingers, put it on the top of her head. Katie, who before going down in that water didn't even realize she could be forgiven. Didn't even have an understanding that she could have her sins washed away, never for the Lord to remember those again. When Katie's head came up out of that water, he said, that's what I've been looking for. That's what I've been wanting. That's what I've been looking for. There are some Katie's in this house today. And you got a preacher standing in front of you that tells you anybody can be forgiven and have your sins washed away. So that's going with God's help going to be the culture that we press into this year. Anybody, anybody, anybody can be forgiven. I want you to stand with me, please. I preached a long time. I'm sorry for going so long. And so this altar call today, I'm going to ask people not to move in and out right now. This altar call today has three different parts. If you are here and you want to be forgiven, listen to pastor right now. Anybody can be forgiven today. Anybody can go down in the waters of baptism and have your sins washed away God never remembering them again. That's good news for somebody today. You don't have to wait another day to be forgiven and to be cleansed. So this altar call is for anybody. There's another group of people. You're a somebody who says that this year I'm going to lay it down for Jesus. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to let the excuses go. And I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to sell out to Him. And then this altar call is for everybody that wants to reach everybody. 
soul winners here today. People that say, Pastor, this church can count on me to reach the lost. Clear enough? If that pertains to you, I want to invite you to come right now. Anybody that needs forgiveness, somebody that wants to follow him in discipleship, everybody that wants to reach him. Press in. We're going to let the Spirit of the Lord help us today as we close.